All right, greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal here, or Adams Van Sale, here to shine a light on the goings on down south. And here tonight to help me, or rather this afternoon, it's not, uh, it's still bright outside um, because me and Renee are trying to beat load shedding or rolling blackouts. So I had to move the chat a little bit earlier. But uh, Renee is my colleague at Afri Forum and she's going to help me shine a light and illuminate some of the things that uh, young Afrikaners and specifically Afri Forum youth are doing here in South Africa to make a difference on university campuses and also just in the lives uh, of young people. And I'm looking very, looking forward to it. Uh, and it, this is specifically with the, the aim of, uh, for those of you out there that are non, non-African speakers or are international listeners and watchers, to get a better idea of what AfriForum Youth and Renee do on a daily basis. So, um, uh, ek en Renee gaan ook een Afrikaanse gesprek binnenkort op uh, my Afrikaanse kanaal en alle RNC, so jylle kan ook daarvoor uitkyk, um, maar hierdie gesprek specifiek is uh, sommige vir mense wat uh, nieuwskierig is oor wat Afri voor hem jeug doen, uh, maar nie noodwendig Afrikaans machtig is nie of in die buitenland sit. So uh, welcome on the show Renee, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Aris. Thank you for having me and thank you for throwing in an Afrikaans <laughs> paragraph so that everyone can just be reminded that English is not my first language. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, just the other night when I was doing another stream as well, my English uh, also ran out. Uh, I told the audience that I'm I'm, I'm getting stuck now because my uh, my <laughs> my uh, the amount of English words that I had in my brain just uh, just depleted. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's start off with something just simple, and that is, uh, what do you use before we get to Afri Forum Youth specifically? What do you do at Afri Forum Youth? I know, but the audience doesn't, or most of them probably doesn't uh, don't. So, um, can you give us a little bit of an idea of what your role specifically at Afri Forum Youth is? Yes, yeah, so I'm a campaign officer at Afri Forum, especially for Afri Forum Youth campaigns, um, and this obviously vary from from um, racial classification campaigns mm. where we stand up against it all the way to maladministration and corruption of the mm. government. So it's a variety of things that we tackle at Afri Forum Youth, but um, specifically I'm at the acti activist um, side of Afri Forum. Hmm. And uh, the now the broader uh, Afri Forum Youth, um, you seem to be doing everything at Afri Forum Youth from what you've described. You cover every uh, aspect, but uh, more broadly, what does Afri Forum Youth stand for? What does Afri Forum Youth try to achieve? Yes, yeah, so um, I actually did not cover everything since um, the activist part is only one part of Afri Forum Youth, a very important mm. part. Um, this is obviously where we act on behalf of the interests of young Afrikaners, um, where we try to tackle the challenges they face each day. But then also Afri Forum Youth strives to create a safe and welcoming environment for young Afrikaners where they can um, build friendships and where they can also um, um, be, feel welcome as this mm. is also not always the case in the country we live in at the moment. And um, then also Afri Forum Youth has different branches in different places. So um, very important to also do the groundwork to be there, um, to, to be a, 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 so that young people can associate with us um, at the ground level as well. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's also very important uh, that you mentioned that the fact that uh, Afri Forum Youth also tries to give Afrikaner youth on specifically ca uh, university campuses a place where they can feel at home, where they don't have to feel like they're t constantly targeted or under attack or even uh, as going as far as, as we heard now from Stellenbosch University, where they're being told they're not allowed to speak Afrikaans or they should only speak English. Um, I mean, this is the type of toxic environment where, well, where organizations like Afri Forum Youth are so important to create that welcoming um, uh, space for Afrikaner youth where they can just be themselves. They don't have to be fake. They don't have to pretend to be something that they're not. Yes, definitely. And also the um, cultural traditions where uh, in other places in the country you are told to be ashamed of that, you are, are, are told to be ashamed of your cultural heritage, your cultural identity. Um, therefore, Afri Forum Youth is also very important to um, to remind, it's an important role of Afri Forum Youth to remind young people that um, you can be proud of your cultural identity and your traditions, your heritage, and um, then also to create a safe space where you can live this out where you can um, enjoy those experiences of cultural traditions that is um, 
that is very old and precious to us and um, that is not welcome at other places anymore. Mm. I'm just going to read some uh, of the feedback from the comments. Uh, remember, if you have any questions uh, about AfriForum or AfriForum Youth, you can just leave it in the comments and we will answer them or get to try to get to them. Nathan says, I love what AfriForum is doing. And Sideliner Opinions says, you have already brought some much needed energy to AfriForum Youth, Renee. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that. Well, thank you for the compliment. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, you've been very busy already, but uh, I think what, what you've also touched on is that AfriForum Youth is not just about, uh, the, there's two sides. There's the, the fighting side, but also the building and the, the, the welcoming side. And I think that's important to note that it's not just uh, standing up against injustice or things that are wrong. It's also uh, creating uh, things that, uh, spaces where Afrikaner youth can also just uh, take part in their traditions. Um Rene, you were you were on uh, in university. Do you have any traditions on uh, on campus that, uh, that you remember very fondly that you enjoyed and that played a, a big role in your in your student life that you enjoyed? Yo, there there's um so many that it would be difficult to just <laughs> single a few out. But mm. I would say um, one that is actually um, quite precious. It was irritating at that time, but now when I think back, it was actually so precious in the hostel or the residence where I, where I was on at university. We had this tradition to cover our farm as first years during the orientation um, time. We had to cover our farms with a, with a black piece of material um, and then with like a, a racky <laughs> to keep it there. Mm -hmm. And it was to symbolize that we won't hike because we already found our home and that this is our hostel, is our new home. Um, that's just something that's so precious because, to, especially today, because today I hear all the traditions that is being taken away at my old hostel. And then I just think, is it still, will it still feel like home for students coming there um, when they don't necessarily feel welcome to just be themselves considering their cultural identity? Mm. Well, that's the thing. That's why these traditions are so important to to uh, to preserve. And that's why I asked you about an example, because through that example, you show how it's not just something stupid that people do. It's not just something that that uh, has no purpose. That that tradition that you named as an example already shows that uh, these traditions are in place to make uh, students feel at home and to give them that type of message that uh, you can uh, be part of this thing larger than yourself. But if the environment doesn't, uh, if, for example, the hostels or residences don't do these traditions anymore, it will have to be up to uh, organizations like AfriForum Youth to uh, keep them going in, in some capacity. Um, do you have any uh, examples of how AfriForum Youth, some activities that you do, or I know there was a, a youth conference uh, earlier this year. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Just some of the 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 type of spaces that AfriForum Youth is creating for for young people to to take part in. Yes, yeah, so I I think back about my university years very fondly, especially with regards to traditions which helped um, develop develop myself and which helped to um, create a, a feeling of that I belong and to build strong friendships because when you when you go through tough times together you can also enjoy the good times so much more so this type of um, this type of aspects created by traditions and a, a student life is now mm. what Afriforum youth also needs to kind of replace so we, we also try to still protect what is left um, at the universities and in the hostels or the residences but um, where they are being taken away we try to create that kind of spaces so for example the the youth um, congress that you mentioned that specifically focused on the developmental target that AfriForum youth has to help develop young people so um, to empower young people with um, networking um, skills to network with other people and to to build, build out some practical ideas which can be executed in the year for example social activities like um, the Afrikaner traditional dance is called Soki and um, this is this was also 
part of my university years, a big part and a great part of that. Um, and now where this is also being taken away to some extent, for example, last year, there was an instance where um, there was a whole social media fight about an uh, Afrikaans song that has been requested um, which would then typically be a, a soki song, a, a song on which you can dance. Um, and that, that caused some trouble at an official um, hostel event. So now Afriforum Youth at the Congress, for example, empowered young people to, with a plan to a blueprint which they can use to organize this type of social event at their campuses where people can then come and soki, um, which they can't necessarily do at hostel or residence events in anymore mm. and that's so important because uh, these are i mean it's uh, it's a uh, it's not a very heavy example but something as simple as soki dance i mean it is part of that student life specifically for afrikaners i mean it doesn't it's something that everyone enjoys uh, but afrikaners particularly but the thing is if i remember that incident that you're talking about and if you're taking these types of activities away under the banner of being inclusive you're actually excluding a group of people by removing a type of activity that uh, that they enjoy. I mean, it it's so strange for me. A lot of the things that are, that are being done under the the banner of inclusivity or just exclusivity and in, in, under a different name. Um, I mean, yeah. you saw this now at Stellenbosch as well, where you exclude Afrikaans under the name of inclusiveness, but you're taking something away from someone else. It's uh, and we see more and more of this at uh, at uh, NWU as well, and we'll get to those two stories um, uh, particularly later. But that's why it's so important to have an organization like Afri Forum Youth, where students are being excluded under the name of inclusivity. Have you have you noticed the same thing? Definitely, definitely, and th that is the perfect example of double standards, and mm. that is a perfect example of something that Afri Forum Youth would like to expose and to um, apply public pressure to kind of um, do away with these type of double standards, because it's actually shocking that people would believe, okay, this is inclusive, by we are excluding these people, so we are being inclusive, um, and then um, apart from that being like the perfect example of double standards that we have to face in South Africa each day, it is also just being swung around, that concept is just being swung around all the time whenever something is being done that's not necessarily right, um, that it's just swung around because this concept is so politically correct in the time that we live in South Africa today that they just use it anywhere. I mean, for example, getting back to the traditions of our hostel, one tradition being taken away was um, it was actually like a rule for for anyone in the hostel. You're not allowed to drink a drink out of the bottle because you are a lady. So you need to drink out of a glass. Um, I mean, this is not I can't I can't see any way that this can be disrespectful to someone. But still, this this is one of the traditions being taken away because they say it's not inclusive. So, um, yeah, that that concept is actually um, it, it actually became a, a concept that makes me sick because it's just mm. being used wrongly all the time. No, it's it's like I said, it's just something being a word that's being used to cover uh, discriminatory behavior, to cover uh, behavior that targets certain groups. And I mean, that's what's happening in a lot of these cases that Afrikaner and Afrikaans students are being targeted. Um, and I see here. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> but last riding vlogs says, uh, says, uh, really enjoy your stuff here from the UK. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, uh, sideline opinion says, if you want to decode woke speak, invert what they say, um, Nathan has a, a in general question for AfriForum. That's what, uh, is AfriForum's plan for disabled Afrikaners? Well, that's very simple. When it comes to uh, those in your community that are struggling, for example, if they are disabled, um, to not, uh, uh, take part in certain activities or struggling to be part of uh, certain things that the community does. Um, the, those communities where those disabled Afrikaners are have a responsibility towards those people. I mean, this is an idea much older than, than our time. It comes it goes back all the way uh, to the beginning of our, our history, where those in your community that are less fortunate or those that are disabled need to be helped by the community. But 
they shouldn't you shouldn't leave that up to the government that the government should come in to help those people your community has a responsibility towards them to help them in their in their life as as and to help them become uh, uh uh full members of your of your community and to help them uh, do as much as they can as well to take part in community activities and to contribute to your community. So any type of barrier that stands in their way through their disability, um, the community has a responsibility to help them in any way to uh, to enable them to be uh, productive members of that community as well. But like I said, this is an old idea that goes back all the way to biblical times. Um, let's see here. Uh, White student transmission says inclusive sounds like a legalese term. Do they post the written definition anywhere? No, the definition just changes uh, whatever uh, to whatever they needed to be uh, at that time. That's been my experience. Um, so yes, another, can, oh yeah, like I give an example, um, the like the Employment Equity Act um, would literally mm -hmm. state <laughs> that. Um, that they want to be inclusive so they will use racial classification to determine who um, who will be employed so that inclus inclusivity will be reached so that is like literally um, the contrary concepts right next to each other in one in one paragraph in the official employment equity act so um, yes the, that term definitely gets used in wrong places with the wrong definition a good example as well as non-racialism. The ANC loves to use the term non-racial. We're a non-racial party, but they've passed over 116 pieces of racial uh, legislation since 1994, and they actively discriminate through their policies against minorities in South Africa. I mean, this is uh, these words uh, are like, for example, BEE, Black Economic Empowerment Policies. They have nothing to do with black economic empowerment. They have everything to do with Carter economic empowerment, giving opportunities to the politically connected and to uh, politicians to just fill their pockets and their wallets. So uh, the, the people discriminating, the people targeting uh, minorities and the people being exclusionary are actually the ones using all these beautiful words. But uh, you should always judge a tree by its fruit, uh, not by what people say it is. If someone tells me that is an apple tree, but there are lemons on the apple tree, that I will know that that person was a liar, and I know it will be an apple tree. So that's the thing, is you have to judge not what the intentions of these policies or actions are. You judge them by their fruits. You judge them by their, uh, their results in reality. Um, and that's, I think, uh, what you, uh, with many of your uh, AfriForum youth campaigns do, is that you judge all these things that you are taking on, all these injustices and discrimination you're taking on on university campuses. You're doing so because you're taking on what they actually are, not what they claim to be. Yes, definitely. And, and as you said, we will get into the um, Northwest University situation a bit later but that is also um, just a perfect example where the official spokesperson says that they are tied to their goals of um, inclusivity and um, racial diversity and whatever but um, then the the exact theme going on in the article is precisely about the opposite of that it is about racial exclusion taking place and um yeah, it's like in the policies of the universities, I, I don't have to single out a university because it seems as if all the public universities in South Africa has these policies stating that they are, want to be inclusive and that, um, that equality is so important. That's another concept being swung around all the time, equality. But um, then in the paragraph just under equality, they say that um, the people that would be appointed at the university or the students that would be um, have to go through admissions, will um, have to come by, come past the um, racial classification rather than merits. So, um, you know, it is, it's very worrying that, that, people, that there are people out there that, that believe these concepts for what they are supposed to mean, but while they are actually used for the opposite. Mm. And before we get to the specific examples of the campaigns that you've been doing, um, except for uh, uh, 
uh, their language being targeted and uh, racial discrimination. Uh, are there uh, other challenges and obstacles that uh, Afrikaner youth specifically on uh, campuses are facing? If, if, if those two are the specific ones, um, can you elaborate or um, uh, uh, give us some more details on the, just some of the challenges that uh, a young Afrikaner student on a, a public campus today in South Africa, some of the challenges that you often hear about, the type of things that people contact Afri Forum youth about? Yes, so um, racial classification and discrimination is certainly a very important one. And um, if only it was it was applicable only to university campuses, but unfortunately it is applicable everywhere in South Africa. Um, so this entails everything from getting um, getting chosen for a sports team. Um, there's racial quotas, getting um, the opportunity to study, so to be admitted for a specific course that is also um, you also have to get by racial classification and discrimination for that and then also for job opportunities and um, bursary opportunities so that is very important a very important one but um, then also i think um, on a more ideological note hopelessness is also um, a challenge for young afrikaners as um, they see the the state failure um, the high crime rate the youth unemployment rate that's just skyrocketing and there's this um, this kind of hopelessness for a future in our beautiful country, which is obviously something that Afri Forum Youth does not advocate. We definitely advocate for um, a prosperous, safe and free future here in South Africa. Um, and then also one that I cannot miss is um, cultural identity and the loss of cultural identity um, because of the, the because of it being threatened. So if we look at the history being taught in schools, um, the just the ideology being um, propagated all around South Africa by the president even, saying that um, you know, Afrikaners just inherited rich and that other pol political leaders would say that we stole the land. Um, and then specifically, you, you would get a minister of higher education saying that Afrikaans is not an indigenous language. Um, you will even get a minister of sports, arts and culture saying that the Afrikaner heritage should all be moved to a theme park of shame. So there's this, there's this huge threat of cultural identity, this huge question that young people face that, but can, am I allowed to be proud of my, my heritage? Am I, prou am I allowed to be a proud Afrikaner? And they feel threatened to answer yes to these questions. So that is definitely also a, um, a very important and worrying challenge because obviously if you do not know where you come from and you're not um, allowed to be confident in, in who you are with your cultural identity, then the challenges ahead will be so much more intense. Hmm. No, well, those are definitely what I would also uh, uh, think of as, as some of the key challenges. I just see a, a non-popular newsreel, Freud, Jelle Krach. Uh, no, me and uh, Renee. Uh, I think Renee's power is going off uh, at the end at, at six o'clock. Uh, mine is already off, but I'm using a battery uh, for my for my Wi-Fi. So I think just at the end of this episode, Renee is going to be... Uh, uh, engulfed in darkness from the rolling blackouts, but I think we should be uh, we should be done by then. Um, yeah, Rana, I don't really have a lot to add to those challenges. I think the the whole idea or the 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 question surrounding identity is very important. I think I'm glad that you mentioned it because there is a little bit of a, a, a struggle going on amongst young Afrikaners. I mean, when you're in an environment where uh, from the from the university itself in the textbooks, uh, in the school environment, from the government, everywhere, you're just getting these attacks, these uh, messages that uh, you have to be ashamed of who you are, you can't be proud to be an Afrikaner, you uh, you have to constantly be, constantly be groveling and apologizing, and uh, you have to constantly be talking about and saying that you'll condemn your parents and your grandparents as evil, bad people, um, and that nothing that uh, your forefathers did was good or everything was bad. And that message is just constantly thrown in your direction. It's a very toxic environment. It's a very difficult environment to be very, to be frank, uh, for, for young people, because you, 
I mean, you you already stressed about a, di- a whole different uh, range of things at that age. You're stressed about exams, about your, but maybe about your relationship, uh, maybe about some drama in your friend group. These things are what what young people are, are worried about. And now you also get all these attacks and targeting from the institution itself and from the school, or the university itself, from the government, in the media. All the the media is just filled with messages that you should be ashamed, that you should be guilty for things that you didn't even do. And uh, that's why it's also important to not only talk about this, but also when uh, AfriForum Youth, for example, has a, a conference or a get together of young Afrikaners, it's an opportunity to talk about the fact that uh, no, there's there's actually not a collective guilt or shame that we should be feeling. Uh, we're not going to be apologizing for something that we didn't do. And uh, when you actually see other young Afrikaners standing up for that, then that gives you hope for the future. It gives you courage. And uh, it's very nice to see other young Afrikaners being brave. But that only happens when that that happens more when you start getting together and talk to other like like minded Afrikaners and realize you're not alone. There's more of you out there. Yes, definitely. And um, just to, I, I'm sure that you mentioned it quite a few times on your cha- cha- um, channel already, Ernst, but um, just the, how far our history stretches is 371 years. That's when our first ancestor arrived in South Africa. And ever since, um, my people have contributed to build and um, make this country prosperous. So, um, no, no, it's not something to be ashamed of. It's not, not something that should be or put in a theme park of shame. But on that note, with the minister who said that, um, it was obviously also with reference to the ongoing vandalism of our Afrikaner cultural um, heritage, for example, monuments. Um, and this is just also another example of uh, um, the toxic environment, as you mentioned, uh, just adding another challenge to the young people's lives, of, of Afrikaner lives in South Africa, to um, try and, and also um, challenge this idea that you are supposed to be um, guilty and that you are supposed to feel ashamed. So definitely something that um, should be exposed for to be just untrue and something that should be um, that we should help contribute to towards so that young people can stand up for what they believe in and that young people can can um, treasure the the moments that is worth it in our history and uh, mm. build further on that. Mm. And on the note of bravery, uh, Renee, you probably, in your role as Afri Forum uh, Youth, uh, as a representative of Afri Forum Youth, but even before that, but specifically now that you uh, work with a lot more uh, young Afrikaners, you probably meet uh, a lot of brave young Afrikaners out there, uh, the, just to show that they, they, they exist, they are there, and you, uh, you probably encounter them regularly. Yes, so I would um, actually like to start off by saying um, this is very, this makes me very positive. I think that um, the more our our culture are being targeted and um, challenged, the more the people are starting to stand up and starting to be more brave about this. So that is great. I I really saw in the few years that I've been involved with um, trying to shed light on the truth in South Africa, I have met um, more and more young people who feel the same and who feels very strongly about this. And um, yeah, it's like the, the fire in their heart is still there, the flame in their heart. But um, when they are surrounded with like-minded people, it's like oil being added to that flame and it's just a huge fire and this fire can spread. Um, so that is, that's positive. That gives me hope, certainly, that there's more and more young people who's willing to stand up as the times and the challenges are becoming more difficult. and. Um, then also i would like to say that the the importance of this courage is magnificent i mean um, i saw someone once asked but you are doing all this stuff um, but what has changed since uh, what happened since you are doing all this stuff and mm-hmm. one could rather ask well what would have happened if no one did something so um, that is very a very important question to ask and that is why this courage of young people is so important because um, Afri Forum Youth can also only act on behalf of young people whose interests we um, hold dearly so if there's not if there is no one who is willing to stand up and is willing to ask us to for help or 
assistance, then we can't act. We can't. Ta we can take no action if there's no one to to act. Or if there's no one who's on whose behalf we can act. Mm. So um, courage is very important, and I I love seeing more and more young people taking courage for the things that they hold dearly. Mm. And one of those things that uh, young Afrikaners hold very dearly is uh, our language of Afrikaans. And I know you as a young Afrikaner uh, definitely hold Afrikaans very dearly as your mother tongue. But um, And this is the last thing that I wanted to talk about before we get into some examples of campaigns that you did uh, recently. Um, just from the heart, why is it so important to have uh, Afrikaans uh, as, as a, a tertiary education option where a young Afrikaner, why is it so important that a young Afrikaner should be able to study in, in their mother tongue? Yes, so except for the sentiment that I have for uh, my forefathers who uh, worked so hard to develop this language so quickly into an academic language and to build these universities um, and to just put Afrikaans on the map in academics, um, except for that sentiment that is a, a huge plays a huge role in this, it is also just um, so important to be able to study in your mother tongue because um, people excel when they when they have opportunity to do this so um, I differ from people who say that the business world is English and everything is English so why just not start off by studying in English um, well I would have struggled more at university if I had to study in English for sure so um, it's definitely important for people's ca characteristic development as well to have this opportunity and also it is in line with international language rights to um, to kind of emphasize the importance of mother tongue education. Hmm. And uh, yeah, it's absolutely, uh, I mean, that's that's no secret that it's much di more difficult to study in a second language than if it's already hard enough to study in your first language. Uh, now you have to study in your in your second language as well. I mean, um, that was my experience at Stellenbosch as well, where uh, I had to translate all my textbooks because uh, there just weren't any Afrikaans textbooks. Um, I see uh, Brendan Hill says, Thank you that you English for us praat. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for your boodskap, Brendan. Yeah, so I say, I get the Afrikaans kanaal, but uh, this uh, channel specifically is for my non-Afrikaans listeners and uh, uh, international listeners, or when I speak to guests that are uh, that can't speak Afrikaans. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But I will uh, uh, definitely have this conversation with Renee and Afrikaans on my Afrikaans channel as well. Um, but yeah, on that note of mother tongue education, also Renee, um, it's it's not that when people say you need to be able to you need to study in English to uh, be successful. I'm like, tell that to all the other countries that have their students study in their home language in their mother tongue. I mean, this uh, countries like uh, uh, China, countries like Japan, countries like France. Uh, countries like Germany, countries where students are studying in their in their first language, they're not studying in English, but they are successful. Um, why why should uh, South Africa now uh, just force all students to study in one language, a, a language that's a minority language in South Africa? Um, I think it would be much better, and uh, if we actually empowered many of the other indigenous languages of South Africa to also. Uh, uh, get to a tertiary education level rather than breaking down Afrikaans uh, let's empower the, that's what uh, should have been done the past 30 years but the ANC has have done nothing like that uh, just showing their contempt uh, for the, the the linguistic diversity of South Africa the ANC don't care about culture the ANC don't care about the different lang indigenous languages of South Africa they only care about standardization they only care about English um, and uh, that's the thing. When it comes to uh, what's happening in South Africa on campuses, we're just seeing an attack on Afrikaans. We're seeing something taken away from students, not something being given or uh, created or built. You're just seeing attacks and the destruction of something that has been created. The, the fact that Afrikaans could go from a very basic language at the beginning of the previous century to a tertiary level language uh, in less than 100 years is nothing short of a linguistic miracle. Um, only two other languages have achieved that. Um, so this is something you should celebrate. And then you use that model. You look at Afrikaans as an example, and then you do that for the other languages in this country as well. But no, 
um, we have to destroy to take away something from people, something that they love, rather than build up something that uh, that other people love as well. I see uh, yeah. um, uh, the goose uh, said, "Young Afrikaners is bezig om op te staan vir hulle kultuur, sien dit dagelijks, baie hoop vir die toekomst. Ja, uh, yeah, you wanted to say something, René? Yeah, I wanted to say that you actually just um, said everything that I would like to add to that topic because um, Afrikaans could certainly be used as a model for other languages. It would be great to see um, all the languages in South Africa develop onto that level where it can be used at tertiary in um, higher education institutions. And actually, the, I don't know what the legitimacy of the statement was, but the Vice Chancellor of the Northwest University's Butch of Strom campus um, told me face to face that he admires Afrikaans for um, for exactly that that you just mentioned that in less than a hundred years it could develop so quickly so um, I don't understand I, I can't see why this can't be used as a model to develop other languages mm -hmm. rather than to break down our language and um, then also I would like to um, give us at the side note shout out to your great documentary Arons um, and um, because I want to mention something that was said in that documentary and um, and um, it was said, I can't remember who the person was, but he said that he made the statement that it seems as if the ANC does not believe in the 11 official languages of South Africa, but that they rather want one official language, which is English, and that everything should be standardized, as you said. And this is worrying. This is um, worrying for a country who boasts about cultural diversity um, and a country whose tourism um, sector especially focuses on this cultural diversity, that this cultural diversity is actually being um, challenged by not developing these languages and not actually recognizing these languages as official languages only on paper, but not um, in the real life out there. Mm. Yeah, it comes back to that uh, that message of judge a tree by its fruits, not by what people say the tree is. Um, then also, I just wanted to to mention, yes, that who you quoted there was Russell Lamberti. And yeah, he um, uh, had a lot of great inputs in that documentary. The documentary is called self Bestir. Um, uh, you can uh, watch my previous stream where I talk about that. But thank you very much, uh, Renee, for referencing that. I see uh, uh, Offense says, Happy International Mother Language Day. I was uh, unaware that it's a uh, happy interna that it's International Mother Language Day. Well, that makes our, our chat uh, about the importance of mother tongue education uh, very apt. Uh, and like I said, uh, me and Renee will be having the same conversation in Afrikaans very soon on my and Allah Aaron's uh, channel. There's a link in the description for that as well. Um, Yiz says, uh, "Great stream today, wonderful guest. Thank you very much, uh, Yiz, for tuning in." Um, Sideliner Opinion says, will English one day be called the language of state capture in South Africa? Well, we're going to have to see. Um, all right, Renee, let's, I've, I've been promising the audience this for a while now, but I wanted to get the topics out of the way first that deal with broader things that don't have a time uh, attached to them, not think current events, not things currently happening, but rather that are relevant, uh, uh, constantly relevant. But let's take some two examples of things that happened recently to actually demonstrate our points that we've been talking about here today. The first one, I mean, you've you've been very busy the past few weeks. You've been uh, in Afrikaans. You'd say the uh, You've just been running around that the, the the dust has been been kicked up. So so busy have you been? But uh, you've been doing excellent work, and uh, specifically the two campaigns that have been giving you sleepless nights, uh, but sleepless nights for justice have been uh, what's happening at the Northwest University and at Stellenbosch University. But let's start off with Northwest University, NWU or PUKA. Um, there's a scandal about racial exclusion going on there. What, what happened there? Can you give us the, the quick summation and then what's AfriForum Youth doing about it? Yes, so quickly on Saturday 11th of February, they had their annual welcoming event for first years in the amphitheater on campus. Um, this is a great opportunity. This is the first exposure for first year students to a student life. Um, and then Afriforum Youth, um, some of our my team members were there on the day on campus and um, they saw that there's this large group of students just standing outside of the amphitheater like this. <laughs> and um, then were, upon investigation, they immediately found that um, they were upset because only the previous night, half past um, 11, 
the the house committee members of this residences were informed that their first years aren't welcome in the amphitheater they will only be allowed to watch a, a live stream of mm. the event um, in separate venue at separate venues and then um, also it it was upsetting to the students that there was a reason given that it is due to racial uh, the lack of racial diversity in the hostels so with the mention that um, these hostels well, it won't look good on camera for the Northwest University um, if, these, if these hostels are too white. Um, so that happened and it was shocking. We immediately um, wrote a letter to the Northwest University, the director of student life, with very important questions to um, just get behind the um, the gist of this. And unfortunately, they failed to answer any of our questions. But I think the reason for that is because um, in the meantime, there has just been even more things unraveling and um, we have been acting even more viciously <laughs> upon these findings. So then a SEC member was um, dismissed from her um, position and then she, she also came to us for help and we offered her legal assistance because we found that um, it seems as if she has been dismissed because she stood up against this um, racial classification going on at the university. So at this moment, where that is at this moment, is that we sent a lawyer's letter to the university um, stating that they should um, put her back in her position at the SEC and that they should also um, give a public apology for her unjust removal. And they only have until Friday, one o'clock to do this. Otherwise, we will have to go to court. Mm. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, there it does appear like the university is trying to brush this under the rug, trying to create the illusion that they've solved the problem, that they take this very seriously by uh, removing her from her position, this, uh, this brave student that stood up against injustice and exclusion and discrimination. Um, but uh, from your side, it does, uh, your, from the facts that you've seen, uh, it seems like she was in the right. She was just standing up against injustice. Yes, yes. So she also, um, yeah, I mean, there's proof that uh, another SEC member said that, uh, said this quote of a racial um, diversity that is not enough in the city residences that was excluded. And um, then this illusion was actually made by the university that, okay, so the guilty SEC member is now dismissed, but then um, upon investigation, we found, well, this SEC member that has been dismissed is actually someone who um, did the opposite. She stood up against this. She said this is not right. Um, and then they uh, accused her of a few things and then they dismissed her. Um, and all of this happened in um, a few hours, if you can put it like that, a few days. But it was like in the um, hours of the evening. Um, so it was very drastic. And um, I hope that with this campaign, we will definitely apply so much public pressure and also um, take the, the route of the court to ensure that the university, um, the university's policies, if it would be so, that it is um, just very bad with racial discrimination, that it should be exposed and it should um, be changed immediately. Yeah, again, an example of uh, people being excluded on the uh, on the grounds of inclusivity. Really, uh, really shocking stuff uh, going on there. But all the best to you to fighting uh, racial exclusion there at NWU. Um, there's another story that happens in the same week. Uh, sure, and I, I actually felt a bit sorry for you that you get. I mean, this is the work that you love doing, but it's still work. It's still a lot that needs to be done, a lot, a lot of work and effort and time going into this. But in the same week, we hear, and this is not the first time we hear allegations like this. Um, as I understand it, uh, students went to the uh, South African Human Rights Commission and complained that uh, they were being told that they're not allowed to speak Afrikaans uh, at the welcoming events at Stellenbosch University. Did I, uh, did I get the details correct there? Yes, so there were a few um, accusations or a few um, statements made by students, that is one of them, but a few statements where 
they um, said that they are being prohibited to speak Afrikaans under any circumstances. So um, there's examples where students are being threatened with humili um, humiliation if they dare speak Afrikaans, um, where someone said, um, God, where someone found someone to speak Spanish and say, say, okay, did you understand? And when the students say, said no, and they said, okay, well, don't speak, don't dare speak Afrikaans. So um, even though Afrikaans is um, the largest language in the Western Cape, um, if I have the stats correctly. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely it, correct there, yeah. Yeah, and they are still um, targeting this Afrikaans speaking students and making, actually um, feeding them fear to speak their mother yeah. tongue in, in informal situations. So um, even if me and my sister, for example, want to speak Afrikaans to each other on campus, we can be told to not do that because we are being. Yeah, if, one of these, uh, if one of these language police uh, catch you or hear you, Yes, yes, and um, this is seems to be representatives of the University of Salambos. So it is very worrying, and as you mentioned, it's not the first time this happened. This is this is very worrying because in 2021 there were uh, also th this type of things that came out, and then it was reported to the South African Human Rights Commission. And up, up until now, um, the the report where they investigated this or the outcome of the investigation haven't been made public. Um, and it would be actually be very important to see that, to know, okay, well, what, what did they say and what did the university do about this? Mm. Sure. Quickly, how quickly things move. I mean, when I was at Stellenbosch University, just, uh, I mean, in the grander scheme of things, not too long ago, for me, it feels very long ago, just uh, in, uh, in between 2015 and 2020, um, I mean, then it was still being talked taught about. Taught, they were still being talked about. No, Stellenbosch is an Afrikaans university. English students are welcome, but Afrikaans has a, a, a primary place uh, here at Stellenbosch. We uh, are very proud of our Afrikaans heritage and Afrikaans as language is welcome. And now here we are today, where students uh, are scared to speak Afrikaans on the. Uh, uh, university campus lest they be overheard by some language police that will either shame or target them or, or uh, have them face uh, any type of other consequences it's uh it's really shocking stuff and i see uh, the goose says shout out to student plane for supporting afrikaans speaking students at stalinbosch absolutely there's the spelling um go to student plane's website uh the goose if you can just uh, post the website there in the chat i will put it on the screen as well um, or I think you can find them on Facebook too and on Twitter as well. But they are fighting the good fight over there and the, the campus of, uh, of Stellenbosch. Um, on that note, also, Renee, what has uh, AfriForum Youth done um, in regards to fighting this, this targeting of Afrikaans and shaming of Afrikaans students um, and uh, attacking Afri of Afrikaans students on the, the, the Stellenbosch University campus? So we um, immediately acted by writing a letter with important questions. For example, um, what will they do to the guilty um, students or mm. representatives of the university who did this? Um, and we sent it off to Prof. Wim de Villiers, um, the, also the Vice Chancellor of, of Stellenbosch University. And we gave them until the end of this week to answer our questions. So um, we will be on serious lookout for that. But um, otherwise, we are making plans. We are I'm consulting with our lawyer about um, further steps that can be taken to ensure that that this will not continue because um, it is it's targeting the human. It's challenging the human dignity of Afrikaans speaking students if they are not allowed to speak their mother tongue. Mm. Um, so this is very worrying. And then if I can just add something else, um, as you mentioned, how quickly things changed. I mean, um, we are the same age uh, around about. So uh, the, the time I was at Northwest University is also not that long ago. And um, even now, there's still students who, um, who seems to be unaware of uh, uh, the things changing so rapidly. Um, they, they try to ignore the, the facts and try to focus on, on what they're still allowed to enjoy, um, which, which one can understand. <laughs> but um, it is worrying that it seems as if, um, as if the university tries to cover it up, tries to make these changes so gradually, even though they are radical. Um, and this this always always forces me to think 
what what is the reason you're off why 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 won't they just be blatant about about the agenda and then when one has to ask is it maybe because um for at north west university for example the um, Afrikaner students money is still wanted and needed the alumni especially the old students do they still want to please them by saying that they want to um, promote Afrikaans at the university and also at San Bos University do they also um, want the alumni to think that they, they want to promote Afrikaans and then actually there's other things going on uh, because this is this is something that upsets a lot of people if um, it, our money is good enough but we are not good enough. Hmm. Now I think the uh, Islamic speaker up your I think you are on on, on target uh, with that analysis. Um, I think something else that uh, I think that covers the two main stories. The, the those are developing stories, and I think people just need to uh, keep an eye on Afri Forum Youth's uh, social media pages. Um, uh, for that, there are links in the description to both uh, Renee's uh, social media and then also Afri Forum Youth social media if you want to go follow. There's also links to the press statements about both those stories if you want to go read more. Uh, the latest is there in the description of the video. Um, Renee, now I just want to ask you something about the bigger picture you as a young Afrikaner here in Africa uh, we've been talking about the problems and I mean that's important we need to diagnose what's going on we need to point out injustice and also fight it as you are at AfriForum Youth but in the bigger picture in the face of racial discrimination the targeting of your language uh, shaming from uh, people in the media and from the government um, what what gives you hope here at the southern tip of Africa what gives you hope as a young Afrikaner for the future Yes, yeah, so um, it may seem like a cliche now, but AfriForum truly gives me hope <laughs> because the concept of AfriForum, which um, uh, which empowers each person to be able to um, be part of a practical solution, that gives me hope for sure. Um, so just the, the whole idea of um, not being reliant on the state or dependent on the state, uh, but rather focus on the strength of community um, because through this, one can um, r jump into a practical solution by taking part in your community, actively taking part in your community, um, tackling the unique challenges you face in your environment. Um, and um, in that way, that gives me hope for sure. Um, then, of course, the uh, my relationship with God and knowing that he planted me yeah he planted my people here yeah, 371 years ago and he didn't do that for no reason he has a plan um so i trust for a, a future in his hands here yeah, in south africa um and then of course just the beautiful country that it is <laughs> um you can't you can't give up hope if you if you step outside and see the majestic um natural landscapes and the beautiful creation we live in here in South Africa. So that also that also gives me hope because I know every time I see it, I know it's worth fighting for. And I know there's other people who feels the same way. So that gives me hope. Hmm. Well, that's a beautiful answer, and I thank you very much. Uh, when it comes to hope, I'm uh, that's also important. An uh, important part of my mission with this channel is to make people understand that uh, here in South Africa, what we're doing here through your Afri Forum or other initiatives, we haven't lost hope. We are actually very positive about the future because we can see the, the fruits of our labor. We can see what we're doing, making a difference. And that gives us meaning in our life. And that gives us um, the opportunity actually to be par parts in God's bigger plan. I mean, this is bigger. What we're doing here is bigger than just the Afrikaner folk or bigger than just AfriForum in general. It's a part about being parts of God's bigger plan. And I'm I'm very thankful for the opportunity to uh, follow my calling um, here at the southern tip of Africa. As you beautifully said, we are here with a reason. Uh, it isn't just some throw of the dice that uh, had us end up here. That's a very strange way of looking at uh, how things work. Um, I see uh, Yiz was also a big fan of what you said. Uh, she says, uh, what a beautiful sentiment. Yes. I, I just want to add, Adam, um, 
that, as you mentioned, being part of um, what is happening and everything that is being built at the beginning, you also said uh, at the start of this um, video, you also mentioned that Afri Forum Youth is not only fighting, we all are also building just as the rest mm -hmm. of Afri Forum and the larger solidarity movement. So often when I, um, like the past week when I was very busy, um, my closest friends would, would, would feel sad for me and, and actually feel hopeless with all the fights we are facing. But um, then I remind them that uh, they should not feel hopeless because I don't, because even though I, I face this um, every day, I also face everything that's being built. So especially um, having mm. talked about the university campuses, we shouldn't, um, we should keep in mind that the Solidarity Movement is busy building a university as well, a private university already mm. built a private um, college. So that is certainly something to um, admire and to give us hope. Mm. Absolutely. And uh, uh, just on that note of, uh, of hope, uh, one last thought from my side. Um, yes, the, the things that we at Afri Forum and Afri Forum Youth, what we do, uh, it's often uh, to a lot of people, it looks scary. It looks daunting. They're like, how can you uh, face all this evil and all this injustice? And my answer is very short always. And I always just say, because someone has to. Um, it's not for everyone. I don't expect everyone to become uh, Afri Forum uh, activists now to uh, do what we do, but it's someone has to do it. Um, so I'm glad to be able to be one of those people. And I know you are as well through your actions and through your involvement at Afri Forum Youth. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad to be part of something bigger than myself. And uh, it's, it gives me a lot, of, uh, a lot of hope myself and a lot of meaning uh, as well on a personal level. Renee, what can people do if they want to support Afri Forum Youth? Um, what are some of the things that they can do? Can you give us an idea? Well, you said that you would put the links or you put the links in there. So mm. you can give them a follow and just um, look at what they are doing and support that. Um, and then obviously can become a member of Afri Forum. But for our international friends, I would think just, mm. to, um, to, just to hold our cause close to your heart is also important. Mm, absolutely. All right. Um, then lastly, um, just some things at the end of the, the episode. I always ask my guest, if you, are, if you could leave the audience with something to think about this week, just an idea. Um, it can be very short. It can be long. It can be a question. Anything that you'd like to put in the back of their mind to think about this week, uh, what, would you, what would you leave them with, with? What would you tell them? Um, you're putting me on the spot now, so I would just refer back to what I said earlier. Um, the question mm. that I asked, um, what does all this help? What has happened or changed since all this action has been taken? But to rather ask the question, how, how would have things been? How would things look if no one took action at all? Mm. I think that is an important question to ask because it will bring you to the answer that Afri Fuerem and um, what we are doing is much needed. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to quickly answer here one question here because I think this is important for people that might be confused. Uh, Waipe asks, uh, did she marry as Renee Kriya, right? Yes, uh, Renee was Renee Kriya and now she is happily married as Renee van der Pfeiffer. You can see that in her, in her Twitter bio as well. But uh, yeah, Renee, thank you very much for joining me here today. Thank you for your inputs and for what you do there at AfriForum Youth. Um, I also just wanted to add... Um, uh, again, uh, people can go watch my documentary, Self Bastid, if you want to know more about what Afri Forum does and the broader uh, solidarity movement. Um, my previous stream, like I said, was about that documentary that came out uh, last week. Um, thank you also for everyone that tuned in. Thank you for your questions and inputs and comments. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, you can help out the show with a like. You can also, if you're not watching live anymore, you can still take part in the conversation with a, a comment down below in the comment section. I read all of them, respond to as many as I can. Um, and then also, lastly, uh, if you're new to this channel, you can subscribe um, for more conversations like this. Next week, I'm talking to Rory Duncan about the Rwandan genocide, that he was actually in Rwanda during that time. And he's going to give us some very interesting insights about his experience there during that time. So look forward to that. Um, also, if you are subscribed, uh, but you somehow miss the when I go live, uh, remember to click the bell next to subscribe so you can get a notification when I go live. So you know you can be here for your live questions uh, and uh, live comments. All right. 
uh guys uh, i hope you have an excellent rest of the evening again renee thank you for your time and uh, all the best of luck with all your campaigns and uh, i'll see you guys next week for another episode cheers guys have a good one and god bless